We're going to go back this morning to a time about 479 BC to a time in the history of the people of God that for whatever reason didn't return to Jerusalem. They stayed in Persia. They decided that they would stay in Persia rather than returning. Esther is a very special book. Have you ever wondered, where is God in my life today? Have you ever wondered, where is God in the world right now? What is happening? Or let me put it to you another way. Where is God in all this? Unless you've not been looking at the news for the last month or so, some of the most horrific, most barbaric, most cruel things that I've known in my entire life have just happened. And we have people, Westerners, rejoicing over these things, rejoicing over these things. And the question has to be, where is God in all this? Well, God isn't mentioned in the book of Esther. There's no mention of God. And yet he's working behind the scenes in the most mysterious way. The Lord moves in mysterious ways his wonders to perform. And we see him moving in the background in the, in the book of Esther. So, Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for this precious, precious gathering of saints this morning. As we pour over your word, how your word speaks into these situations, Lord, is incredible. Very rarely, Lord, do you answer the why questions. You seem to answer them through patterns in Scripture. Patterns. Things that repeat themselves. And we begin to see you in the background. And we pray that you would bring a great deliverance, Lord, in these days to come. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Esther can mean hidden. It can mean hidden. And there's no doubt that it's the sense, the sense is that God is kind of hidden behind the scenes in this book. And it says, Now it came to pass in the days of Azurus, which is Xerxes the first. We, we, we believe that it, this is Xerxes, that uh, Azurus is, is basically like saying Pharaoh, it's just a title. Who reigned over, now get, this is massive, okay. Who reigned over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. This is the biggest world empire that had ever been at that time. This is massive. In those days, when King Xerxes sat on the throne of his kingdom, huge kingdom, which was in Sushan, the citadel. Now, what's interesting is, is that in Daniel 8, Daniel's in Babylon, and he has a vision about the future. And in the vision, he's in Sushan. He's in the very place where this deliverance, this incredible thing will break out. Daniel in Babylon has a vision of being in a place 200 miles east of, of, of where he was, of Jerusalem. And of course, Daniel is a, is a, is a very interesting chapter because the Greek empire smash the Persian empire. And if you, you have to try and understand how that works out in our day, but the Greek Empire smashes the Persian Empire. In those days, when King Xerxes sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Sushan the citadel, 
that in the third year of his reign, he made a feast for all his officials and servants. The powers of Persia, or Iran, Iran, and Media, and the nobles and the princes, and the provinces being before him. So, this king had a six-month party, a six-month party. Can you imagine that? Imagine how much food and drink went into that. We know by the scriptures that the, the, the king basically gets drunk and he demands that his queen, Vashti, come before all the officials. But this was a six-month party and it was supposed to be an, in anticipation of an invasion upon Greece. Ultimately, as you know, in history, the Persian Empire gets its backside well and truly whooped. Let's go to verse 12. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command. It seems such a, a matter-of-fact thing. What, what has this got to do with the rest of Esther? This thing, well, it, it sets the scene for Esther to rise to the very, very, very top of this huge empire. One of the things that the Jews are always criticised of is that they always rise to the very top. Wherever, whatever dispersion they're in, they seem to rise to the top and they seem to do very, very well for themselves. And here, because Vashti refuses to come into the king's presence, it prepares the way for Esther. And that's what you'll see in this book. You don't necessarily see God, you see the effects of God preparing the way in the background. That's how most of the time he works in our lives. Sometimes there's these blatant miracles, but they're not, it doesn't happen very often. But he works in the background in mysterious, wonderful ways. He sets things up. Now let's go to chapter 2, verse um, 5 here. Now, in Sushan, the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai. Now, this is important. The vast majority of the Jews that were living in Persia at this time were secular. Do you understand? They were not particularly a God-fearing bunch. They had the chance to go back to Jerusalem, but they didn't go back. Now, in Jeremiah 29, he says, I know the plans I have for you, and I want you to, to dwell in the city that I take you and pray for the peace of that city and so on and so forth. Build houses, get married. That's what Mordecai had done. And actually, he was a good citizen of Persia. That was a command, but he did have the opportunity, as did the rest of them, to go back, and they chose to stay. But as we go through the book, you realize, thank God they chose to stay. <laughs> it's another God incident. So, Susha and the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, and he was getting on in age at this point the son of Jah, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Now, that's interesting because Saul also was a Benjamite. And Saul was commanded to deal with King Agag, wasn't he? And, he? and he wouldn't. And so God raises up another Benjamite to deal with the same spirit. Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured with Jeconiah. Jeconiah is the king that had the curse on his line. And that's why in Mary's genealogy, Jeconiah is not there. You understand? 
king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And they were carried away, and they refused to take up the option of going back. Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter. She had neither father nor mother. The young mother, the, the young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So you see this lovely relationship here between this older man and this younger daughter, basically. And we see this relationship where one needs the other. And we see that in the church, don't we? We should do. You know, every Esther, every young Christian should have Mordecai's that they look up to. And Mordecai's that are getting on and mature and so on, and they've been there, done that and got the T-shirt, they need to look after the Esthers. We, we need one another. And in this situation, there's this beautiful relationship. Now, next week, we're going to look at a massive challenge that Mordecai gives this woman because she's rose to this point. A massive challenge. To us, it doesn't seem massive because we've read it. We know how it works out. But it was a huge challenge. So it was when the king's command and the decree were heard, and when many young women were gathered at Sushan, the citadel, under the custody of Haggai, the, uh, that Esther also was taken to the king's palace, into the care of Haggai, the custodian of the women. Now the, women, the, now the young woman pleased him, and she obtained his favour. So he readily gave her beauty preparations to her, besides her allowance. Then seven choice maidservants were provided for her from the king's palace, and he moved her and her maidservants to the best place in the house of the women. See the favour? And it's wonderful when we get favour. It's, it's a wonderful thing. But there's normally a reason why we get favour. There's normally a reason. And it says in verse 10, Now Esther had not revealed her people or family, for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. And I think you'll probably find that that's just about beginning to happen around the world right now. That very thing. We've gone through decades where to have a Jewish person in your life, in your church, is just the most wonderful thing. It's such a blessing. Such a blessing to hear Messianic Jewish teachers. Such a blessing. And we have rightly looked to them because they do have a, an understanding of Scripture. They really do. But you can see what's happening now with the with the um, the Star of David's going up on the houses and spraying them and marking people out. It is the the thing that alarms me the most, friends, is not Hamas. Hamas doesn't alarm me at all. What alarms me is Europe. That is what is thoroughly alarming. And every day Mordecai paced in front of the court of the woman's quarters to learn of Esther's welfare and what was happening to her. Each young woman's turn came to go into King Azeris or Xerxes after she had completed 12 months preparation according to the regulations for the women. For thus were the days of their preparation appointed six months with oil and myrrh, and six months with perfumes and beautification. Now, I heard a message on this many, many years ago that blew me away. And it was talking about the two stages that every person has to go through if God has something for them in this life and God has something for everybody but there's two stages to getting yourself ready 
when the Lord calls you into the plan that he has for you. And the first stage is myrrh. Myrrh. And myrrh, of course, you understand, was used for burial. So the first stage in a, in, a, in a Christian's life, if God is singling you out for something, as Peter says in the letters, don't be surprised when things happen to you that you never expected to happen. Don't be surprised when you fail. And then there seems to be failure upon failure. Don't be surprised when you're rejected. Don't be surprised when you're completely misunderstood. People don't understand you. Don't be surprised when you, when you go through all kinds of pain and illness. Don't be surprised when your own family don't understand you. Because if God is calling you, to make a difference in this world, you must have your season of myrrh. And in that season of myrrh, there's an alabaster jar that's broken. And the fragrance of your broken life comes before this holy, mighty God. There has to be brokenness. You have to be broken and poured out. And Jesus said about the woman, that message will go to the ends of the earth because she understands. Every Christian has to go through a process of death, burial. She's anointed me for my burial. Death, burial and resurrection. And so when these things happen, they do happen. And sometimes it goes on for years. Not six months. Not even six years. It can be 30 years. There's no time limit necessarily. But there is a season of myrrh for every child of God. And in that season of myrrh, it is very easy, or it should be, if, you, if you're born again, if you are born again of the incorruptible seed of the word of God, it is very easy in your season of myrrh to cry out to Jesus. It's the, it's the most natural thing in the world to cry out to him in your season of myrrh. The problem isn't necessarily the season of myrrh. The problem is, what do you do in your season of beautification? When everything starts to go your way. When you rise to the position that God has put for you. What happens to you in that time? When the call comes and there has to be a sacrifice and you're now in the palace. You see, friends, most Christians can call out to God in their season of myrrh. It's when things are going well for us. It's when the job's going well. It's when we've got our health it's when we've got the house we want, the car we want, the friends around us, when there's peace on every boundary and, and, and you've got the position or whatever it is that you feel that you want to do in church, when everything's working out. That is when the big test comes, not in the season of myrrh. And that's, we'll look at this next week, that is the big test for this woman. What do we do when we're in the palace? Velvet Underground uh, sang a song called I'm Beginning to See the Light. And part of the song was this. There are problems in these times, but woo, none of them are mine. I'm beginning to see the light. And there are so many people 
that are living today. And as long as it's not directly affecting them in their palace, it doesn't matter. They don't know what's going on. They haven't got a clue of the suffering that's going on around the planet because they're in their palace and that's all that matters. But the challenge will come to you. And we'll look at that next week. Let's skip through to uh, verse 20. Now Esther had not revealed her family and her people, just as Mordecai had charged her. For Esther obeyed the command of Mordecai as when she was brought up by him. So now she's the favorite. She's the king's favorite. She has favor. She's gone through the myrrh. She's now, well, things couldn't be better for her. But she's still not revealed who she is. She's still not revealed who she is. There are some brilliant minds, aren't there, right now? Some brilliant speakers, even in the secular world, some brilliant Jewish speakers. They're out there. Everybody knows who they are. I was listening to one the other day. He's got, he's got a brilliant mind. And he spoke to uh, some real high-ranking uh, people uh, in this auditorium. And he said to them, we are in the fight of our lives. We are in the fight of our lives. In those days, while Mordecai sat within the king's gate, remember what the command was in Jeremiah 29, to seek the peace of the place that you're in, to build houses and so on. In those days, while Mordecai sat within the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Bigthan and Teresh, doorkeepers, became furious and sought to lay hands on King Xerxes. I mean, you've got to be pretty crazy to do that, right? You see the size of this man's empire. They must have been slightly unhinged. That's all I can say. But they plotted to kill this king. So the matter became known to Mordecai. There were many Jews in Berlin that they, they were convinced that they were good citizens, right? And that they were as much a citizen as the indigenous Germans. And I believe that Mordecai, that's how he saw himself. Who told... So, who told Queen Esther, and Esther somehow informed the king in Mordecai's name. And when an inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed, what was confirmed? That there were two men that were trying to assassinate this king. And both were hanged on gallows. Now, that word hanged isn't necessarily quite right. It's, they were, they were, they were put onto spikes and skewered. And it was written in the book of Chronicles in the presence of the king. Now I want you to notice here, Mordecai should have been rewarded really for what he did here. And there are times in our lives where we do the right thing and we know we've done the right thing. We've done the right thing by people and by God and no reward comes. And you think, well, I don't know. I won't do that again. <laughs> Once bitten, twice shy. <laughs> and it does happen in life, doesn't it? You do the right thing and you think, well, we'll at least get a thank you or something. And nothing is forthcoming at all. Who would ever think that this little piece here about Mordecai basically saving the life of the king would be the very thing that would end up being the deliverance of the Jewish people? But 
We, we so want that kind of bird's eye instant praise, don't we? You know, that microwaved thank you, that drive in, oh, aren't you wonderful thing. And we, we kind of, we don't realize that our God is the ancient of days and he holds all things, all time is in it. And his timing is always perfect, perfect. So if you've done a good deed to somebody and nothing came back your way, don't worry about it. God knows what he's doing. God knows what he's doing. It'll make sense eventually. Now, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, from seemingly nowhere, Haman appears. And it's as if by magic, remember Mr. Ben, the children's program, as if by magic, Mr. Ben appears from nowhere. It's like, we don't know how, he just comes on the scene. And chapter 3, verse 1, it says, After these things, King Xerxes promoted Haman. And now, hold on a minute, shouldn't Mordecai be promoted? <laughs> Remember when Joseph said, remember me to Pharaoh? Remember me to Pharaoh? Two years later, oh yeah, I forgot. I forgot I was supposed to say something. Instead of Mordecai being promoted, this despicable human being is promoted from nowhere. Haman. The son of Hamadatha, the Agagite. Once, if you know the Old Testament, once you read that word, the Agagite, well, you should at least start to go, Sss, boo, boo, behind you. Because <laughs> this guy is a villain. He's a nasty piece of work. What is he doing being promoted by the king? What's the king thinking? How come he can't see Mordecai? Have you ever felt overlooked? Oh, how come that one seems to be getting all the attention? It doesn't matter what I do. They never, they never see it. It happens in life all the time. It happens in families all the time. And advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him, from seemingly nowhere. One day the Antichrist will arise, and it will seem as though he's come from nowhere, but the mystery of iniquity has always been with us, and the roots go way back. There is an ancient evil. And this man, Haman here, his roots go way back. What's happening in the Middle East right now is not about Palestine. The roots go way back, way back. You can read in the Quran. The Quran will tell you at the end of time. Even the trees and the rocks will cry out, there's a Jew here, come and kill him. The roots go way back. This isn't about Palestine. It's an ancient tribal evil. How come people can't see it? We love to go to Scotland, as you know. And one of the um, things about going through Glencoe is, is that you have to go past Jimmy Savile's bungalow. So he had this, you've never seen a house like it. It's only small, but it's a white bungalow. Honestly, I, I have no idea what it would fetch today, but nobody wants to buy it. It's covered in the most sick graffiti. I mean, they just spray. And every time they come and whitewash it, people will go back and spray it, make sure that nobody forgets. How did that man that was hidden in plain sight, how did he get access 
into hospitals, into prisons, how you can see him on top of the pops. You can see him when he's being filmed, pinching girls' backsides. How did that man get away with it? How did he get away with what he did in the hospitals and what he did? This was a man that, that, that was friends with Peter Sutcliffe, the Ripper. We, we have no idea how much this man got away with, and we never will now. He was an animal of a man, but he was hidden in plain sight. And the things that he would say were so outrageous that he, Jim, it's just Jimmy being Jimmy, you know? I'm the most feared man in all the girls' schools. Or whatever I want to get my hands on, I'll get my hand on. Are you a paedophile, Jimmy? Yes. He was hidden in plain sight. He kept giving clues. That's what they do. They love it. They get a high off it. Kept giving out a breadcrumb trail. But nobody saw it, or did they? I believe there were people that did. I believe there were people that were covering for that man. I'm convinced there was. So how come it didn't come out? I'll tell you how. They were frightened. They were frightened. The people that were abused were frightened of what would happen to them. Even the police, some of the police were frightened because he was part of a ring. He's a very powerful man. They were frightened. And because they were frightened, nobody said anything until he died. And then one after the other, after the other, after the other. They're all coming out of the wood. We're over 500 cases of sexual abuse. He, he would even wheel corpses off into rooms and touch the corpses. How come this never came to light? I'll tell you, fear. Fear. And there is a fear right now, and you know, there is a fear right now in the West that is crippling us. And people are so frightened to say what's in their heart to say. People are seeing evil tra being transformed into good and good into evil, and they're frightened to say it. But then you have psychologists looking at the profile of Jimmy Savile afterwards, looking at all his body language and saying, see, that was a lie there, that was a tell there. What's the point in that after the fact? That's no good after the fact. If you don't see it before you see it, you'll never see it. And here we are right now, and there is such a fear. It's crippling the West, it's crippling democracies. Folks, we've had 400 years of Christianity. What is happening to us? Fear. It's fear. It was fear with Jimmy Savile. And it's fear. Nobody dare say. Nobody really dare say what's on the mind. People are getting careful about who they even speak to or what they upload now because we are reaching a point of critical mass. And if this goes much further, there's no coming back from it. Let me show you, friends, just for a few minutes, and we're going to finish um, because our God is so good, right? And as frightening as Haman was, and he was, he was a vile man that rose to power from nowhere. He got his comeuppance. Have a look at Genesis chapter 25. Verse 22. But the children struggled together within her... And she said, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. That's always a good thing to do. It really is. I'm serious. Before you go on all the websites and the things and have a look, ask the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. That's probably why you're struggling a little bit. <laughs> Notice this is not about two people. 
It's about two nations. And out of those nations, more nations are going to come. Two nations are in the room. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. We don't get it, folks. We have what you call the nuclear family. Mum and dad, couple of kids, maybe three at the best, or in some cases a few more than that. <laughs> and that's your little tribe. And you go through life and you protect your little tribe. That's your little tribe. That's your nuclear family. And that's how we see things. So we see what's going on on the news, but it doesn't affect the nuclear family of the West. That's how we think. But that is not how it is in the Middle East. It is tribal. And these are ancient tribes. And the way that they deal with things is alien to us today in Western society. It's alien. But this goes all the way back to Genesis 3.15. There's an enmity between the two seeds. And it becomes tribal in the Middle East, as we'll see. Have a look at Exodus chapter 17. The mystery of iniquity has always been with us. It's always been there. Exodus 17, verse 8. Now, what's important here is that the children of Israel have just complained again to God whinged, moaned, complained. That's all they ever seem to do in the wilderness is whinge, moan, and complain. And all of a sudden in verse 8 it says, Now Amalek, who is Amalek? Well, Haman is a descendant of Amalek. Do you understand? Haman didn't just come from nowhere. The roots go very, very, very deep. What's going on in the Middle East right now hasn't come from nowhere. The roots go very, very deep. And we have two-thirds of the Bible that are given over to explaining this stuff to us. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out and fight Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him, and he fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone and they put it under him and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands. One on one side, the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. This teaches us something, church, today. We are out of our depth. What's going on right now is way out of our depth. We're out of our depth. The world is out of, the, out of its depth. The nations are. Because this is not political. It's spiritual. And until people realize this is not political, Hamas is not a political organization, it is spiritual. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But they are mighty for the pulling down of strongholds. So there is, there is a way. But this way is through prayer. Paul says, I want all men everywhere to lift up holy hands in prayer. That's what Paul said. And here we see Moses lifting his hands up in prayer. When people put their hands up like that, it's a position of surrender. 
I'm surrendering to you, God, because I am powerless. This church victorious stuff is nonsense. The world is going to hell, folks. There is so little salt today. Generations are getting worse. They're not getting better. The world is getting worse. People are becoming more cruel, not less cruel. This idea that the the church is going to take over this planet and Jesus is going to come and pat the church on the back and say, oh, I couldn't have done it without you. God bless you. They're out of the depth. You're out of your depth with Haman. You're out of your depth with Herod. You're out of your depth with Doag. You're out of your depth with Sennacherib. You're out of your depth with this kind of stuff. It's demonic. And the battle belongs to the Lord. Have a look at Deuteronomy 25, 17. Remember, notice that, Deuteronomy 25, 17. Remember, remember. What Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt. How he met you on the way and attacked your rear ranks. All the stragglers at your rear. When you were tired and weary, he did not fear God. Therefore it shall be when the Lord your God has given you rest from your enemies all around... In the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess as an inheritance, blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, you shall not forget. So this begins with remember and it ends with you shall not forget. Why? What did they do that was so wrong? This was not man-to-man combat. This was not soldier-to-soldier combat. This was not arms taking up arms together. This was the weak and the defenseless, the old and the young being slaughtered. This is Amalek. And there, there are many tribes in the Middle East, and some are much worse than others. It it goes without saying that the gospel is for every tribe, for every tongue, and for every nation. And that Christ died for all. And let me say this. This is really important. These people grew up being breastfed on hatred of the Jews. The West wasn't. The West has had 400 years of Christianity. You tell me which is worse in God's eyes. Which is worse in God's eyes? People that have been brought up from tiny little toddlers or people that should know better because they've had the Bible for 400 years. One Samuel 15, one. Samuel also said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore, heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have, all all that they have and do not spare any of them but kill both men and women, infant, nursing, child, ox, sheep, camels, donkeys. The nuclear family in the West just does not get this. We don't get this. We don't get this. It doesn't compute. 
but it does to them. It does to them. So people on the one side will say, those children are going to become fully grown adults and we need to wipe them out while they're young. And vice versa. And so both are saying, wipe them out while they're kids because they're only going to grow up and become faithful to their religion. We don't get it. We don't get it here in the West with our nuclear families and our televisions and our wirelesses and our internet and our entertainment shows. We don't get the tribal hatred that's been going on since time began. And we'll see this next week. Esther probably thought she'd be okay because she was in the palace. No. You're not going to be okay because you're in the palace. Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon. There we sat down, we wept. When we remembered Zion, we hung up our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For those who carried us away captive asked of us a song. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Sing us one of your songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? And if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy, remember, O Lord, the sons of Edom. Amalek, remember the sons of Edom. The day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it to its foundation. So what happened during the Babylonian captivity is that the Edomites laughed and rejoiced and joined in with the plunder and even kidnapped many of the Jewish people, just took them away, did what they wanted to them. And here it says, remember, O Lord, remember, O Lord, the sons of Edom. Just remember. Now let's go to Psalm 83. Not going all the way through this. Psalm 83. Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace. And do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult. Those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your shouted ones. They have said, come, let us cut them off from being a nation. <coughs> Remember Mein Kampf? It's written, it's written there in black and white. People thought, nah, Hitler will never do that. No, that's never, you're never going to get a people that say they want to wipe out the Jews off the map, surely. That crazy guy in Iran, he doesn't really mean it. Oh, Jimmy Savile didn't mean it when he said what he said, but they do mean it. But we, we live in a bubble, folks. We live in a bubble. In the name of Israel, may they be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. Who are they? The tents of Edom. This is tribal. Stop thinking in terms of a nuclear family. Why do you think when Jesus, when they came to him, he said, your parents, they said, your family are here. And he said, who is my family? Who is my mother? Who's my brother? Who's my sister? He said, I'll tell you, it's, it's my tribe. My, my tribe are my mother, my brother, my sister. Why do you think it says in Matthew chapter 24 that father will betray son, son will betray father? I'll tell you why, because it's not going to be a nuclear family. It's tribal. And you're either in the tribe of Jesus or you're in your own nuclear family. Yeah. 
The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab, the Hagrites, Gebel, Ammon, Amalek, they're all there. Philistia, with the inhabitants of Tyre, they're all there. Gathered together. Assyria, remember we looked at Hezekiah not that long ago. They're all gathered together. There's 12 tribes, basically. Did you know that? A kind of a counterfeit. It's tribal. It's tribal. Now have a look at Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles 21. And it, and it happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others. We know who the others are, it tells you later, those from Mount Seir, which is Edom. Edom. With them, besides the Ammonites, came to battle against Jehoshaphat. This is an impossible war that cannot be won. You can't win it. America can't win this war. You can't win it. This can't be won with arms, folks. This is spiritual. Go to verse 12. This is Jehoshaphat. He knows he's up against something that he cannot win. Oh, our God, will, not, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us nor do we know what to do but our eyes are upon you that should be the cry of every christian and we talk about politics like we know what we're talking about like we know these things we don't nobody really does we have no power to fight these people. Now all Judah, with the little ones and their wives and their children, stood before the Lord. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah. And he said, listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you, King Jehoshaphat, Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid, nor be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. The battle belongs to the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Tomorrow go down against them and they will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz. And you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them for the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And I'm telling you, if I was there, I would have done exactly the same thing. Like total relief. Get your face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before Yahweh and worshipped the Lord. Then the Levites, the, the Kohathites, and the children of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices on high. So they arose early in the morning and they went up into the wilderness of Tekia. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall be prosper and when he had consulted with the people he appointed those who should sing to the lord and who should praise in the beauty of holiness and so they did and they cried out praise the lord for his mercies endure forever now while we were away 
I asked the Lord two questions. Lord, what is going on right now and what's going to happen? And in, immediately, without any delay, Obadiah. Obadiah. Just like that. Obadiah. We're going to finish off. Just turn to Obadiah. The vision of Obadiah, servant of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. Remember, there are many Edomites. Herod was an Edomite. Doag, who remembers Doag? The chief herdsman that slaughtered all the innocent priests. We have heard a report from the Lord. And the messenger has being sent among the nations, saying, Arise, let us rise up against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be greatly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who dwell in the clefts of the rock, whose, whose habitation is high, you say in your heart, Who will bring me down to the ground? Though you ascend as high as the eagle, from there I will bring you down. And though you set your nest among the stars, I will bring you down. If thieves had come to you, if robbers by night, oh, how you will be cut off. Would they not have stolen till they'd had enough? If great gatherers had come to you, would they not have left some gleanings? Oh, how Esau shall be searched out. How his hidden treasures shall be sought after. All the men in your confederacy shall force you to the border. The men at peace with you shall deceive you and prevail against you. Those who eat your bread shall lay a trap for you. No one is aware of it. It's tribal. They don't even trust one another. Their unity is in their hatred of Israel. Will I not in that day, says the Lord, even destroy the wise men of Edom, and there are many wise men of Edom, and understanding from the mountains of Esau? Then you mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed, to the end that everyone from the mountains of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. Listen very carefully. For violence against your brother Jacob Shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. In the woke brigade, for years now, they've talked about the hurtfulness of microaggression. We've all heard it, haven't we? The, the offence, oh, the offence of microaggression. These same people... Many of them rejoiced in the slaughter of the babies and the mothers and the fathers. These people that believe in inclusivism have seen the things. This is the crazy thing. We, we've been to Auschwitz. You go there and you take children there so that they will remember but these pictures are not making them think, never again, never again. These pictures are making them think, we want more. Who are these people? Who are they? When, when COVID-19 happened, right, there was this organization that came to the top, Black Lives Matters, and they started to riot everywhere. Black Lives Matters, you know, as though they give a hoot about black people. By the way, my wife is black, yeah? The same organization comes, comes to the fore all over again when this happens, puts up banners. We're behind you. We're with you. Who are these people that rejoice in such a foul, evil thing? The Bible tells you what will happen to them. Those that rejoice over this. London is heaving with people. They're pulling down the pictures of people that are missing, even some of the police. It 
In that day that you stood on the other side, in that day that strangers carried captives, when forces entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, even you who were as one, you were one of them, but you should not have gazed on the day of your brother in the day of his captivity. You should not have rejoiced in that. Th these woke people that celebrate LGBTQ, if Hamas were to get what they want to get, they're not interested in politics, they're interested in Sharia law. If they get their way, they will shoot these people through the head. So the very people that are supporting it will be shot or thrown off buildings, because that's what you do. So how could the woke brigade be backing this thing? There's only one answer, isn't there? Iron and clay. Iron and clay. Things that should never stick together. Things that should never work are demonically fused together. Things that are totally contradictory are demonically fused together. And I believe if this is allowed to get out of control, we will see the days of the Tantos. And we will see iron and clay, things that should never be together, that should be completely opposed to one another, unifying for the greater good. And the greater good, by the way, is the greater evil. But you should not have gazed on the day of your brother in the day of his captivity nor should you have rejoiced over the children of Jerusalem in the day of their destruction, nor should you have spoken proudly in the day of distress. You should not have entered the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Indeed, you should not have gazed on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. You should not have stood at the crossroads to cut off those among them who escaped, nor should you have delivered up those among them who remained in the day of their distress. For the day of the Lord is upon all the nations, all of them. This is not just about something that's happening in the Middle East. It is pervading through because that's the nature of sin. We are reaching critical mass. Places that should know better. Places that have had the word of God for 400 years are being affected by this madness. The day of the Lord is coming for all nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. And your reprise will return upon your own head. For as you drank on my holy mountain, so shall all the nations drink continually. Yes, they shall drink and swallow, and they shall be as though they had never been. But on Mount Zion there will be a deliverance. And there shall be holiness. The house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. The house of Jacob shall be a fire. The house of Joseph a flame. The house of Esau shall be stubble. They shall kindle them and devour them, and no survival shall remain of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. The south shall possess the mountains of Esau, the lowlands shall possess Philistia, they shall possess the fields of Ephraim, the fields of Samaria, Benjamin shall possess Gilead, and the captives of the hosts of the children of Israel shall possess the land of the Canaanites, as far as Zarephath, the captives of Judah, who are in Serapad shall possess the cities of the south. Then saviors shall come to Mount Zion to judge the mountains of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Anybody ever heard a guy's name's Constantine? He's a very good speaker. Anybody heard him? He's a Russian Jew. And he's, he's, he's basically just, just given a speech about we are in the fight of our lives. And he's basically putting out a call to all Jewish people right now that 
you are guaranteed one thing that you're going to die. That's what he's basically saying. He says the only thing that you need to make sure of is that you live before you die. And there are many people that are like the walking dead. They're not alive. Let me come to a conclusion this morning. God created the entire earth. Jesus came because God loves the world. The gospel is for every tribe, every tongue, every nation. The Bible tells us that he doesn't rejoice in the death of the wicked. And he's not willing for any to perish, but all to come to repentance. That is why many Muslim people are coming through. They're having revelations, all kinds of things. It is happening. It's not happening at the rate we would want it to happen. If there was a button here now that said you can press this button and just go into eternity, how many of you will press it? I think quite a few. Because quite frankly, this place is becoming deplorable. It's awful. But there is something that we can do. I want to finish here. We have a part to play in this church. The first thing is this. We have to examine ourselves. It says that the table of the Lord is not ex about examining somebody else. It doesn't say, let a man examine the person that he doesn't get on with. It says, let a man examine himself. We must examine ourselves. We must repent. We have to repent. You're not living in a palace. It's an optical illusion. What has this got to do with you? If you're a child of God, everything. We must examine ourselves. We must repent. You've got to stop thinking nuclear family. You've got to start thinking about tribes. What tribe are we in? We must pray. And when I say pray, I mean seek the Lord. And seek the Lord in the word too. This is time to fast. If this is not a time to fast, I don't know what is. I don't know what is. But it's also a time to praise. It's also a time to praise God with hands in the air, knowing that only he can do this. And finally... It's a time to worship, not just praise, worship. Church, I'll tell you how bad this situation is, right? Even my dad is worried. That's how bad it is. Who knows? Maybe we've been called into the kingdom for such a time as this. Amen.